Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to give a talk this evening um, on three geophysical surveys that have been conducted uh, over the last few years in South Armagh. And it's work that's been done very much by Dr. Siobhan McDermott, who is our geophysicist within the Centre for Community Archaeology at Queen's University, Belfast. Now we've been working with the, the Ring of Gullion Landscape Partnership since 2016, and that's been a program of community-based uh, archaeological investigation. Um, and it's involved excavations at sites in South Armagh, uh, involving the, the, the local community and school groups. Most notably, the, the first excavation that we undertook was at Corner Hove, which was a ring fort. Um, and that was in May 2016. And the excavation was a great success, but great publicity for the monument. Um, and you can see there in the arrow shot, the, the location of the, the trenches that we, we put in. Now, when we come to do an excavation like this, knowing where to put the trenches is always an issue. So if you can get help in that process of knowing where to put your trenches, that's always a good thing because there's only so much of a site that we can excavate. We aren't in a position where we can go out and open vast tracts of land because it's very time consuming. Uh, methodical work. So we identify targets that we can then undertake our excavations at. And that's what happened at Corner Hove. We had a electrical uh, resistance geophysical survey undertaken by Siobhan. Now, even when you've got a situation where there are no above ground traces of banks or ditches present, Asset corner hole. The site may just look to all intents and purposes as an ordinary flat field. But the use of geophysical survey allows us to, as it were, see into the ground. And we have readings, and those readings have patches of what we would call anomalies. Now, we don't know when we're looking at the, the printout that Siobhan produces, if those anomalies are of an archaeological nature or of a geological nature. The only way to be able to be sure is to conduct an excavation to ground truth the results of the geophysical survey. And that's what we did at uh, This is from uh, Lisburn. And uh, there's a map of Lisburn from 1630, which shows the, the, the layout of the, the town. And what Siobhan did was to overlay that map onto the 1835 Ordnance Survey six inch map sheet to get a general perspective on where certain elements of the 1630s town are located on the modern landscape. And you can see that one of the central features is the, the castle, Lisburn Castle. Siobhan and I did the, the geophysics at Lisburn Castle Gardens in the town centre, and you can see there is the anomalies that she obtained as a result of that fieldwork. And of course, what she's trying to do here is she's trying to interpret what, what might these anomalies be. The most striking element of the, the printout uh, is this series of uh, resistance features, R1, R17, R2, R4, R5, R6, and R3, because they're very regular. And we know that there's a castle in the vicinity. So she has colored that in her interpretation as light blue, uh, because it's probably the foundations of the castle. But to establish that that is indeed the case, we would then need to undertake an archaeological 
excavation. Now, there are two methods of geophysical surveying that uh, we use in Queens. First is electrical resistance, which is what we used at the corner hole and what detected the potential castle site of Lisburn. And it's a great method for detecting stone features such as walls, foundations. It's also very good at detecting ditches and pits which have got waterlogged fills. And if you undertake this uh, method, you need to have direct contact with the ground and you have to actually put the spikes into the ground, then lift the uh, instrument, move it forward, maybe 50 centimetres, drop it down again, and it's very slow moving, and this the process can be affected by the, the weather. The second method is much faster, and it's very good, this is magnet, uh, magnetometry, and it's very good for identifying features that have been burnt, things like hearths and kilns, and also for detecting ditches and pits with a magnetic signature. So it's a very fast system. You walk along uh, carrying the instrument, but it's not very good at picking up walls, and it's very sensitive to any magnetic contamination that might be in the soil. But if you take the two methods and you place them together and you undertake both out on, this, on a site, you'll see that the strengths and weaknesses of both can merge. And if you apply both of them together, it gives you a pretty good idea of the anomalies, the nature of the anomalies. And if you want, you can then add in um, an additional technique such as ground penetrating radar, which our colleague Dr. Alistair Ruffle undertakes, and that all helps to with the interpretation of what's going on under the soil as well. The first of the sites that I want to talk about is um, Balakmore Mafia, which is the, the great way of the fuse, and in uh, with the Rural Health Partnership in South Armagh. And it was a funding application that went to the Historic Environment Division uh, within the uh, Department for Communities, their Historic Environment Fund. So they funded the, the, the money to enable a programme of fieldwork to be undertaken, looking for the Balloch Moor. Now that process it was very much embedded in the, the community. Mapping workshop held on the 4th of March 2019 in Collihanna. Uh, and at that event, you had the local historians, Una Walsh and Owen McCann, showing their map work and how they had worked out where they thought the Belloc Moor crossed the Louth border to enter into Armagh up to the Dorsey. Separate from that, Siobhan had conducted a GIS desktop assessment of the, the, the route of the, the Balch Moor, and she had used what's called a least cost path analysis. Now, that's basically a distance analysis tool within GIS, and it uses the path between two locations that costs the least to those traveling along it to determine the most cost effective route between a source and a destination. So you have the local historians and you have the GIS being undertaken by Siobhan. And what both of those uh, processes when brought together, they identified a section of possible route way to the west of Silver Bridge, which could then be identified and charted on the modern landscape. So now you have a target for where this uh, roadway is moving through the, the landscape. Now, the, the Belt Moor is thought to, to follow the path of the, the old coach road linking Silverbridge with Newton Hamill. And it's depicted in a, one of a series of maps by Taylor and Skinner in the 1790s, 
maps of the, the coach roads of Ireland. And you can see that line of the, the Taylor and Skinner uh, line of the coach road shown there uh, in blue. And then you can see the, the route way of the um, least cost analysis. The route marked crossing the, the Louth border at Ballynacosla, uh, and it continues up to the crossroads of Silverbridge, <clears throat> crossing two streams before entering the Dorsey, and then it continues northward. So to, to test this hypothesis, a study area was selected to investigate the area where the old coach road may have run, and a geophysical survey was conducted. You can see here we're very close to the Dorsey, uh, which is marked there at the top of the image. <coughs> now, the geophysical survey doesn't appear to have identified any anomalies uh, of an archaeological nature. During the desktop assessment for the report, however, uh, it became apparent that the route of the old coach road as it passed through the Dorsey had changed. In the 19th century, it approached Burns Farm along the northern ramparts from the south. And as such, our understanding of the road may be incorrect. And it's possible that the routeway may be preserved in the field to the immediate south of the area where the geophysical survey was conducted. But we're still with the, the Dorsey. And we're still with the use of geophysics in South Armagh. As the second project that I want to mention is <clears throat> work that we were doing, we did at the Dorsey also in 2019. Now, the Dorsey is a very well known monument and the form of this massive earthwork uh, has been pretty well established since at least the 1830s um, and the, the work of the Ordnance Survey. And you can see here uh, the depiction of the Dorsey uh, from the 1830 map. And you can see in sections, the, the, there's just piles are identified, but also upstanding areas of the earthwork are shown. Over the, the last 80 years, there's been a, a host of investigations conducted on the lineway of the, uh, the Dorsey. And that's from the, you know, the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, Oliver Davies did a series of excavations up through to the work of uh, Chris Lynn in the 1990s, early 1990s and then through to Declan Hurl in 2002. And it's enabled us to get maybe a better understanding of what is this ancient entrenchment. One possibility is that it is some form of uh, defensive structure, two lines of defense. One possibility is that it's actually some sort of great big enclosure. Uh, but it covers an area of central bog that, that you're controlling access into uh, and out of uh, South Armagh by placing the, the earthwork in this location. And it's not the, the only earthwork that we, we we're aware of uh, in the, the Irish landscape. You also have the, the Black Pig's Dyke and you have the So clearly there was this monumental building process was on, being undertaken in uh, late prehistoric times. The Ring of Gowden Landscape Partnership asked us to, to conduct a, a second programme of archaeological, community-based archaeological investigation. And we, de we decided that we would look at the, the, the Dorsey. Earl's excavation in 2002, which was at an entranceway through the, the bank 
of the, the monument at Bonds Road. And <clears throat> at that time, uh, there was a, a new bungalow was being constructed. And Declan's excavation was in advance of the construction of that bungalow. And what was particularly interesting, uh, marked at A in that little plan of the, the excavation in uh, 2002, was he found evidence of a palisade. So we went back and what we were looking at was, could we find evidence of a palisade on the other side of the Bonds Road? Because if this entranceway into the, the Dorsey is of prehistoric date, and if we've got the, the palisade on one side, could we find the palisade on the other. So geophysical survey was undertaken in as marked there field one and in field two by Siobhan in advance of the, the archaeological excavation to see if we could find targets that could be investigated. And here you can see the, the results of the uh, geophysical survey. Now you can see there that in purple uh, the palisade that was excavated in 2002. Siobhan has uh, included that on her interpretation illustration. But you can also see there on the other side of Bonds Road, you can see linear geophysical uh, anomalies were identified in 2019. The excavation in 2002 had produced radiocarbon dates from between the 4th and 5th centuries BC. If the new anomaly that we identified in 2019 uh, was part of this uh, structure, you would imagine that it would date to the same period. And all of a sudden, we're looking at that opening through the Dorsey being uh, a lot more uh, significant than hitherto maybe was thought that this is actually the historic entryway into the, the uh, earthwork enclosure and that it's framed on either side by stout oak palisades, another layer of protection. So that was where the, the excavation was conducted. And you can see there in the, the photograph where the, the drawing frame has been set out on the ground and the, there's a, a dark stain running across the, the center of the photograph. That's whenever the topsoil was taken off, turf layer was taken off, that came down onto the anomaly that Siobhan had identified. So it was a genuine anomaly and it needed them to be excavated. And that was undertaken by uh, Dr. Cormac McSparren in April 2019. And what was discovered was similar to what was found on the other side of the Bonds Road. You have another palisade. So the results of the uh, investigations, particularly in 2002 and 2019, suggest that the modern Bonds Road, at least where it passes through the Dorsey ramparts, runs along the line of a prehistoric road entering through the, the line of the earthworks. Now, we were very action-packed 2019. Uh, we didn't quite have such an action-packed 2020. Um, we had a full schedule of community-based fieldwork projects that we wanted to undertake. Uh, and then COVID struck. And we went into lockdown as did the whole of society. And all of our programme work had to be put on hold. Now, it wasn't until the summer of 2020 
that we were able to get back out into the field. But obviously we weren't allowed to do any further uh, excavations involving members of the public because of social distancing. But we were allowed to go back out by our going organisation, Queen's. We were allowed to go out and do geophysical surveys. Provided that social distancing was observed and that we were not involving members of the public in any of the field work. And that's what we did. We undertook a series of geophysical surveys. And that brings us to Killy Lochran. Uh, this was the, the Craig and the Global Historical Society uh, who made contact with us to see if we would be interested in helping them to try and establish the nature of a monument that's depicted on the first edition Ordnance Survey um, of the 1830s. We're on the outskirts here of Cross McGlenn, and it's sort of between Cross McGlenn and Craigan. Now, it's marked on the, the first edition uh, with Gothic script uh, as Fort. There's nothing there on the ground today. If you go out into that field, Killy Lochran, where the fort should be, it's just a field. It's pretty flat. Uh, but it still is holding, uh, you know, it's still been denoted by the map, map makers in the 1860s. Uh, it's not been uh, described as a fort anymore, but it's still being depicted. And again, by 1900. So there was something there in that field uh, right up through to the third edition of the Ordnance Survey maps being produced. If we go to the uh, archaeological survey of County Armagh, uh, it's described there as located on a gentle east facing slope with very little remains. There's a hint of a platform about 32 metres across with slight shallow scarp visible on the east. Well, it may be the case that that was uh, so whenever that entry was being uh, compiled uh, back in the 1970s uh, for the Sites and Monuments record. To today, there's very little there at all that would even hint to you that there was a monument in that field. But where, for where the, the, the local historians in, in Craigan, where their interest was coming from, it's the fact that uh, Craig and Church, we, we all know that it's, you know, it's got that association with the O'Neills and the Pews in the late medieval period, but its early history is actually quite uh, obscure. Uh, and getting back before the late 15th century uh, uh, isn't easy. And so there's this suggestion that possibly maybe there was an earlier church at a different site, and that the different site was actually Killy Loch. And the next question is, the earthwork that's marked on the first edition of Ordnance Survey map, is that really a fort? Or is it some sort of enclosure maybe associated with a church site, a lost church site? Now, the late doc Dr. Anne Hamlin, in her 1976 uh, PhD thesis, she noted that uh, Killy Lochran was a church and graveyard site in Craigan Parish believed to be older than Craigan, but not located. So there is this tradition of some sort of church site at Killy Lochran that Hanlon's picking up. But her source of information seems to have been Father Murray, who, who wrote a, an article in the 1930s. And in that article, he notes that there was evidently an older church at a place called Killy Lochran between Craigan and Clos Glen which may have been so called from John O'Loughran, who was rector of the parish from 1478 to 1487. So we identified the field where the, the fort had been located, the fort that's marked in the 1830s had been located. We identified that field and we went out and we undertook our magnetic and resistivity surveys. 
the results, well, the, the, the geophysical survey worked, and the reason we know the geophysical survey worked is because if you look at where our readings picked up uh, deep ditch features, they correspond directly with the location of the fort on the map. But overall, we didn't pick up anything other than that that would identify archaeological uh, anomalies in that area. That then brings into question the church site, because it does look as if this is a, a ring fort, that what's shown in the first edition is a ring fort dating to the, to, to, to the early medieval period. And the geophysical ditch that we picked up is probably the ditch of that ring fort. <clears throat> but whenever we were there, we were doing, conducting the, the, the field work, we were talking to And they were telling us that the they were telling us that the neighbouring field is called the graveyard field, and that might be a hint. Oral tradition surviving. The and encapsulating this knowledge of the church site. They also said that. In that field, whenever there have been ploughing conducted, pieces of coffins were being picked up. So it's possible that we were in the wrong field. And what we did here was we were blinded by the fact that there's a monument denoted on the landscape, and we identified that as a potential. Not in that field, it's in the next field, and that, that may be the location for. Killy Lochran Church. So there's more work to be done uh, in the, that landscape, certainly. But I hope that what this, this talk has, has demonstrated to you is the value of uh, geophysical survey uh, as a tool for archaeologists. It's maybe not as uh, accessible to the public uh, in the sense that they're not getting their hands dirty and they're not doing the, the you know, kneeling in the, in the mud, uh, excavating and finding artifacts. But for us to be able to conduct a successful community excavation, such as at Cove, Cove of Horn, Cove, or at the Dorsey, uh, we need to have targets for where we open up our trenches. And the geophysical surveys provide us with those targets and that then can be investigated in the community-based projects. So thank you very much for, for listening to me and that's the, the end of my, my talk. <laughs>